tonight we're talking about the armor of God. And tonight's lesson title is Are You Armed? So we're gonna start out. We can just turn, can, or rather, can we all turn to Ephesians 10 or Ephesians 6, 10 through 17? And whoever gets there, they can read it first if they would like. <clears throat> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full arm of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, so that when the day of evil comes, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. What verse? All the way to 10 through 17. Okay. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in your place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, thank you. And so uh, just thinking about these verses and whatnot, what I kind of want to do is go through each one of the pieces of the armor and see how these things see how important each of these pieces are in our daily life. So first of all, we're gonna start with the bell of truth. So the bell of truth, just thinking about the simple concept of a bell. A bell is to hold your pants up. And, and likewise, the truth holds up against anything. Thinking about that. And sometimes I feel like we are sagging our pants with the truth around our ankles, trying to showcase God's word sometimes. Or even other times where we're living our lives and we're sagging our pants with lies. And people can see, but yet we're trying to claim that we're Christians and whatnot, because this is an armor of God that we're supposed to be putting on daily. This is something we're supposed to be, you know, making sure we're strapped with these things daily, because like the verse says, this is a spiritual battle that we're in. And if we go into, if you go into a battle unprepared, you could lose your life. So thinking about just the belt of truth, I want to look at some verses. So can someone turn to Ephesians 4.15? Um, someone else grab John 16 13 and i will read second timothy three through four or four three through four so whoever gets ephesians 4 15 they can read first but speaking the truth in love may I grow up in all things into him who is the head christ all right thank you Anyone got John 16, 13? I got it. <clears throat> but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Okay. Oh, I'll hold off and read the other verse, but... Um, just thoughts about these verses and the belt of truth. What do you guys think about what the belt, the belt of truth represents and how we can use that in our lives and just thoughts about the verses so far. This is all about preparation. That's what I say. This is all about preparation, being prepared. As the Bible talks about in the New Testament, 
being prepared. And I was reading this, <laughs> funny, I was reading this earlier today. Being prepared to, prepared to give a word in season, out of season, with salt, with gentleness. So you can give other people a reason why you have a hope in the gospel. For non-believers, that's what I'm talking about. Anyone else? Truth is where it, a, a lot of things hinge from that. If it wasn't true, who cares? I mean, it, like all of Christianity would mean nothing if it wasn't true. And the stuff that we say to people, the stuff that we we interact with them and how we how we bring that up, if what we're saying is not accurate, you know, you're just giving people false hope or, or you're telling fairy tales. There, there's no substance to it. So it has to be truth. So let me add this verse onto it. Let me uh, get your guys' thoughts on this. So 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. And when I read this verse, the part that really stood out to me was um, where it says, who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. And it was just really interesting to me because I was just thinking that what we desire and what we want to hear is like essentially a scratching to our ears essentially it's like a soothing kind of scratching to our ears to make us feel better because it's what we want to hear and i thought about the belt of truth and just specifically talking about truth and sometimes the truth is not what we want to hear or sometimes a belt can be strapped around you kind of tight and you may want a little, little breathing room in the same light but you have this but it has to stay secured it has to stay buckled around your waist to keep it secure to keep it fastened and a lot of times we're loosening the truth or we're creating these half truths or these other things to short or, you know, navigate around the truth or just try to, you know, avoid the truth altogether. And I just thought about that kind of um, imagery and the description in that verse. And it really kind of gave me something extra to think about. So with that added verse, does anyone else have any additional thoughts? My thought was, um, who is he talking to by they? I'm wondering if he's talking about, well, if he's talking about the world, we know the world will, they do their own thing and they don't listen to us anyways. But I'm wondering if he's talking about those who are, um, who are Christian or call themselves to be Christian. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the verse leaves out anything. I think the one thing is that, um, because even sometimes as Christians, we can fall away and we can be susceptible to wanting to hear whatever it is that is going to make us feel better or it's going to make us look better or whatever. And sometimes we're concerned more about our image than the truth. So I think that was a astute point, Claire. I have a question here. Mm -hmm. If a person wants their ears scratched, In my opinion, it's something that they're already doing or want to do. It's like they're looking for permission or someone to say, it's okay. Like you were saying in the end days, people don't want to hear that. That's all that's about. They're indulging and they want to hear something that's going to say, it's okay to indulge. You know, yeah, they want that confirmation that they continue doing whatever they're doing. Yeah, I think that's a good point as well. Um, and so thinking about that, uh, did anyone else have anything on the belt of truth before I went to the breastplate of righteousness? Okay. So breastplate of righteousness. 
when we think about a breastplate, something that guards, something that protects, and specifically when we're talking about a breastplate, this is specifically about protecting your heart because in battle, <laughs> the most the most fatal um, places you can get hit is either your head or your heart. And so breastplate of righteousness is very, very important here. And so, like I said, this is for protecting your heart, for guarding your heart, which is something God calls us to do. Mm-hmm. And so with that, I'm going to read Proverbs 4, 23. Can someone else grab Proverbs 14, 12? Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, no, I'll let someone else read Proverbs 4. Uh, someone else can read Proverbs 4, 23. I'll grab 1 Samuel 16, 7. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can do four twenty three. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone got Proverbs fourteen twelve? I was just thinking about um, Proverbs twenty three seven. As a man think, if so is he. Even in his heart, so is he. You said fourteen one hundred. 1412. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is in the way of death. All right. Oh, are you looking for 1412? It was 1412. Uh, Manny just uh, read it. It um, said there's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. And then I will read 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that... there. There's a couple of things I'm thinking, but the one thing that immediately comes to my mind is the difference between good and right or good and righteous, because oftentimes we hear a lot of people say um, a question I've heard people say religiously when they're questioning uh, Christianity is, well, why would God let good people die and all this other stuff? And the thing that we have to recognize about um, the word good, <laughs> uh, Manny, do you mind if I use you as an example? No, I don't know. Okay, so but there's a difference between good and right. And kind of, we just, um, me and my family experienced this last week with a piece of bread, a piece of garlic bread. Everything is good, but everything is not beneficial. So my mom had a, had a, had a half piece of garlic bread that was hers. And Manny came, I was eating my dinner, and he came strolling by and he saw the garlic bread. And it looked good to him. It looked good. And he said, yeah, I want that piece of garlic bread. I'm like, that's mom's half piece. I said, I wouldn't do it. And then he says, but she left it there. She could have finished it, you know, da, da, da. So I'm like, it doesn't sound like a good idea. This doesn't sound like a good idea. And so Manny went ahead. He ate the garlic bread. (laughs) And then right on cue, here came my mom. She was upset about the garlic bread. And then out of Manny's mouth, right after that, when my mom went back in the room, he's like, Ah, everything is good. Everything is beneficial. <laughs> and, I, and I thought about that. And I think about this good versus right. And yeah, it was good to him, but it wasn't right because it was my mom's. And I've even read in a passage one time where there's a lot of things that are good. A person who's robbing a bank thinks it's good to steal, but that doesn't make it right. And a lot of times we try to confuse the two. We try to merge the two together when good and righteous are not the same thing. And so thinking about that, what do we think? All I have to say is everything is permissible but not beneficial. Oh my goodness. I, I think that when you when you think you're doing right, that's when you're the most dangerous at doing wrong because it all is making sense. There's nothing slowing you down. You are just completely uninhibited because your heart is just all in. 
And just because you think you're right, just because it feels good, don't doesn't mean it is good. Doesn't mean it is right. So it's important to um, to just guard against that at all costs. Yeah, and I like the um, the first Samuel verse, especially because it's talking about appearance. And oftentimes that's how we, quote unquote, go about judging people and whether they're qualified or not, instead of, you know, measuring their hearts. A lot of times we disqualify people. A lot of times we say people are not righteous or because of, oh, their hair looks a little crazy or, oh, they don't believe the same things we believe or they don't do things the way we do things. And so a lot of times we're disqualifying and discrediting people who could be righteous or could be doing right things because we don't agree with them or they don't like the things that we like. And the verse says, but the Lord looks at the heart. And a lot of times we are judges of the appearance, but we are not good judges of people's hearts. And I'm, I'm going to say what um, how I just said that um, one thing might be good for one person, but not for the for another person. And um, I think sometimes it's quick for us as Christians, quick for me, to want somebody to do certain things this way and that way because it worked out for me, but doesn't mean that's what God wants them to do in a sense. Like whether it's um, career path, whether it's um, anything, um, God has a plan for all of us. It doesn't mean one path. That's not like sin and death is the path for us. Everybody. That makes sense. Yeah, like everybody's path isn't the same. Everybody's path isn't linear or symmetrical to someone else's. You know, God could take someone on a straighter path. He could take someone else on a bumpy path. Someone else could be on a narrow path. Someone else could be on a wide path. But, you know, everybody has their own walk. And oh, I think that's a good point that you bring up, Claire, is that, um, oh, how? <laughs> I think it's a good point that you guys brought up. Um, that, you know, those things aren't, aren't, aren't always necessarily congruent with each other. And I even think about it a step further because I, um, I do this sometimes where, um, I kind of like think about it. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if y'all like remember the song, um, turn my swag on back in the day with soldier boy, like hop up out the bed, turn my swag. Yeah. So a lot of times, like, this is how I kind of do it where I'll hop out the bed and I'll turn my swag on, but I won't turn my righteousness on. And it's like, you know, I'm getting ready to go to work. Or I'm getting ready to go out. Or I'm getting ready to go to this or this place. But, and I've turned my swag on. I'm looking good. I'm ready to go. My appearance looks great, but I haven't turned my righteousness on. And so a lot of times I'm going out or going out into the world, which is part of the battlefield. And if you have that righteousness switched off, then it's easier to get to your heart. It's easier for your heart to be um, com convicted and confused by the natures of the world and whatnot. And I think um, that's something I'm definitely guilty of. And I think something even we can all relate to because a lot of times we're more concerned about our image than our identity. And, um, you know, God calls us to have the opposite, essentially. And so um, did anyone else have any thoughts about the verses or any um, anything about the breastplate of righteousness? Well, I was just thinking, I mean, we have to take, we have to take the time to get to know people and not, and not just go by what we see in their outward appearance. Um, because the heart, the heart is just, it's just, um, it's just too, um, um, delicate to 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 not um take the time to 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 get to know what's in someone's heart um yeah i guess that's no um, i think you're right mom uh the heart is one of those delicate things which is why we have to have that breastplate of righteousness because that that's the kill shot right there. That's if you get someone's heart, that's it. Like we we read in the verses where you know you have to guard your heart, and if you don't, then you know we can reap destruction with that just from that. So um, if we're not protecting it correctly, or we're giving our heart to other things, um, and not you know righteousness, then 
we are more susceptible to, you know, judging people's misjudging people's character. We are more susceptible to doing things that are out of God's will. And so um, I think that's also a very um, pertinent point to bring up as well. So um, thank you for that. So uh, this isn't necessarily a uh, a piece well, of the armor, but I was, I, was ahead, just, I was just thinking about the verse Proverbs, Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and, need, and lean not on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. So um, everything, everything starts with us trusting God to, to lead us on the path that we're supposed to be. We have to I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to, it's hard to do <laughs> at times. Um, but, um, we have to stay, um, committed and focused to, um, to doing that because when we do that, we're going to have the best of what God has, um, has in mind for us. Yes, no doubt. I think that's also a good point to add on to that. And so thinking about that and transitioning to the feet of readiness. Now, um, this is not necessarily a piece of the armor, but I feel like this is also another part because our feet are an important part when we're in a battlefield. And so um, thinking about that, the way I thought about our feet of readiness is we have to be able to be on the offense and the defense. We have to be ready to charge towards something or flee from something. And I think a lot of times, because we don't have feet of readiness, we're caught flat-footed, and so we're caught off guard in situations. Um, I think about it like basketball. You know, when a person's getting ready to play defense, if you're not flat-footed, you're not sitting in the ready position, someone can blow right past you or someone can catch you and cross you over. And likewise, if you're, you know, not charging, a, you know, with discipline towards a person who's playing defense, they can steal the ball right from you. And so... I want to go to two different stories where um, I can we can see both examples, someone who was on offense and someone who was on defense. So first passage I want us to turn to <clears throat> is 1 Samuel 17, 26. Um, we're just going to read that verse, and then um, I'm going to scroll down to verse 45 through 51. 1 Samuel um, what? 26, and then that's it's just that one verse, and then I'm going to scroll down to verse 45 and I'm going to go through 51. So um, all right. So 1 Samuel 17 26. David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And then I want us to scroll down to 45 and then I'm going to read through 51. And then David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Israel, all those who gather, he will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is in the Lord's and he will give all of it or he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle lines to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a and a stone without a sword in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's store, sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And so with this story, I feel like David is such a gangster right here. <laughs> David is a straight up gangster right here. You go back to verse 26, and he doesn't just ask the question, if we put ourselves in David's shoes, you just look at it, think about the tone of this question. Just imagine how he asked it. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the, this, this disgrace from Israel? This disgrace? 
Jay David wanted to know because he wanted to know what was up with Goliath. And then you look at verses um 48, and it says David ran quickly toward the battle to meet him. David had feet of readiness and he charged toward it because he knew that he had God on his side and he was ready and prepared. And so I think about that and David was on the offense right there. And so thinking about that story before I read the next story, what are our thoughts? David didn't ask for anybody's advice on how to defeat Goliath. He was like, what's going to happen when I win? It was a foregone conclusion. And for anybody else, that would be arrogant and suicidal. But David was like, I do this. Like, I've already killed a lion and a bear that were bigger than this dude. Which sometimes we think, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to face this Goliath. But you haven't killed a lion or a bear when nobody was looking. So when you step up to face the Goliath, you're going to get wrecked because your feet are not fit. They're not ready. You don't have that experience, that preparation that David already had. God had already brought him through that type of journey. And so when, I mean, if we, I think we're so used to the story of David and Goliath that we get, you know, we get kind of complacent, but that's insane. Like Goliath wasn't just some tall goof. <laughs> Goliath murdered dudes. Like that's what he did. Like he was a champion. Like he's like, I didn't kill a bunch of dudes before. Like, and they all thought they was probably going to win. But David's like, yo, I don't need a spear. I don't need a sword. Matter of fact, when you, I don't want to get too into it. But when David said, I'm going to cut your head off. With what sword? Because David didn't have a sword. But he was like, you brought your own sword for me to cut your head off with. And that's exactly what he did. Just bananas. That's it. That's it. That's that's it. Someone else's someone else weapon. Right? Crazy. <laughs> I do have a question though. Was <laughs> David carrying the 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 sword and sling like this whole? Mm, did did he just pick it up, or was the, is he always carrying that around? Is what I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to ask because he came to the field to give his brother something, correct? So this gangster is all prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he literally stayed strapped like yeah. literally he kept that sling on him he had to get him some rocks from the from the little creek or whatever but he was like i keeps my sling on me so you know, the thing, the one thing about david is that he was too young really to go out there and fight that's why he didn't have a sword but he had that sling that's all he needed Yep, there were a lot of grown men out there with swords who didn't want none, no part of that business with Goliath. So, <laughs> you know, and so I think about that and that was David charging towards something. He had the feet of readiness to charge towards something. But let's think about the feet of readiness. We need to be on the defense and flee. So let's turn to Genesis 39 <laughs> through 11. Can I say one more thing about David? Uh -huh. Go ahead. He said... This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. He didn't just say Goliath. He said all the army. <laughs> He's about that smoke. I'm going to get you and I'm going to get your mans and them too. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so Genesis 39, 6 through 11. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Let's remember that part. Well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife how then could i do such a wicked thing and sin against god and though he spoke to joseph day after or, and though she spoke to joseph day after day he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her one day he went to the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside she caught him by his cloak and said come to bed with me 
but he left this cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. And the thing is, Joseph knew he needed to have some feet of readiness to flee from temptation because Potiphar's wife was trying to give him the business in a way that he was not <laughs> expecting. And a lot of times, if you walked up some temptation like that to our front door, we might stay. We might not run out the door like that. But Joseph gives a, I think he just is a clear example of what to do, not just with um, relating to sex, but even other temptations where the best, sometimes our best uh, action is to run rather than stay and try to fight. Sometimes it's best to flee. <laughs> and so thinking about that story, what do we think? I, I think some. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, brother. No, after, after you. It's too kind. Um, I think sometimes when um, when I go to church, um, I listen to lessons, sermons, and I think I'm glad I'm not I'm not struggling with that. I'm not I'm glad I'm not in this whatever, but just because this was a temptation for Potiphar's wife and not for Joseph. It's because I am, can I be in his position or think, okay, this might be a struggle for me if that had happened to me. It does not omit the message and the point that's being, being um, set out that we need to have our feet ready. I just, you know I me, mean, confession time, that's all. That's cool, I like that. Um, what I was gonna say is, Joseph set up the the prototype. This is literally how you flee temptation. You, you got to turn and you got to run. And it seemed like dude was like breaking a tackle. Like he was he was shaking it loose. Like no, you're not you're not finna get me. And like you can't reason with sin. You you can't you can't try and talk sense into it. And I've told some of my dudes who did not run when they should have run. I said, bro, you can't reason with a naked woman. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You, you don't put yourself in that situation. And that was the first thing that David, that, I'm sorry, that Joseph did, I think to get his feet ready is he wouldn't have sex with and he wouldn't even be around her. Like he didn't, he didn't leave just kind of that, that, that flirtatious, you know, will they, won't they, no, wasn't none of that. He was like, nope, I ain't gonna be around you. And it was only cause she set him up that he was in that situation in the first place. No, I think that's a good point, Mr. Anthony. Um, you know, like some, like sin, you just can't reason with it. It's something that, you know, when you have the feet of readiness, when you have the breastplate of righteousness, you know, to avoid these things and you know the proper course to take rather than stay, you flee. And um, I think, once again, like Joseph was a perfect depiction of what to do. And also, oh, even David, he was a perfect depiction of what to do oh, in charge of the sports. Oh, and so, um, did anyone else have any thoughts about uh, these, uh, either of these stories before we move on? Sorry about that. How's been a gentleman who took um, Macy out for a walk because you've been begging? <laughs> no problem. All right. Let's keep chugging along shield of faith so the shield of faith i thought about this one this one gave me a little bit of trouble because i was thinking about this and i was thinking about kind of the to me it wasn't an overlap but kind of the that extra protection because i thought about the breastplate of righteousness and how that's kind of already a means of protection i was like okay so what would the shield of faith how would that be useful what is that for and the thing i came to was a classic Avenger, Captain America. I, and I thought to myself, and I said to myself, what would Captain America be like if he didn't have his shield? Right, exactly. Mr. Anthony's face says it all. And so um, I thought about that, and I was like, huh, 
he would just be a regular dude, but he would also be exposed. He would also be his body. Everything he had would be exposed if he didn't have a shield. And I thought about our faith and without our faith, we would be very exposed if we did not have that shield of faith. And so, because I think about what a shield, the objective of a shield and its objective is to either block things or deflect things. And some things, when we have that shield of faith, we can deflect certain things. It's like, oh, oh, that's not of the Lord. That's not of the Lord. And certain things we can protect ourselves against. It's that extra protection um, in addition to the breastplate of righteousness. And so I thought about that and how we need to have this deep type of faith. And so can someone read Hebrews 11, 6? And um, someone else grab 1 Peter 2, 17. Real a little louder, Mom. Oh, um <laughs> you already had it. I can hear you. Oh, you talking about the verse? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was saying, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Thank you. All right. Anyone got first Peter two seventeen? If not, I can grab it. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. All right. Um, the version I had um, that I wanted specifically, uh, thank you, mom, still. Uh, but the version I had says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And I'm going to tie this verse into Luke 6, uh, 27 through 36. So, um, I don't know if Mr. Anthony was like making a strange face because he wasn't sure how that tied in, but I'm going to tie it in. <laughs> I'm going to tie it in. <laughs> okay, so Luke 6, 27 through 36. All right. It says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If you're... Oh, if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full but love your enemies do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is the kind because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked but merciful just as your father is merciful and so thinking about tying these two verses in um on the surface it looks we're thinking about the shield of faith and we're talking about the shield of faith and um, you're probably wondering, well, what do these verses have to do with faith? None of those verses, or aside from my mom's verse, none of those verses said anything about faith. But when you're faithful to God, you honor what's in these verses. Ha, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go back. Because the verses Luke 6, in Luke 6, they some of the things it talks about is forgiveness and grace and mercy and I know those aren't the sexy words you want to hear about spirituality, but those are the impactful words that we also need to be carrying out when we're doing God's work. And when we're faithful to God, we give people grace. We give people mercy. If someone slaps you on your cheek, I know it's not sexy to give someone your coat or to let them slap you on the other cheek, but hey, that's what God's will says. And it may not, of course, it doesn't mean that literally, but the point is that we don't go seeking revenge on others. We don't go enacting our own justice on others. And a lot of times we've dropped our shield of faith so we can pick up our sword and start slicing other people instead of granting them grace, granting them mercy, giving them forgiveness. 
And I think when we are faithful and we're walking in our Christian faith, those are also things that we add on to our faith is forgiveness, is mercy, is honoring others. Because the thing about even the second Peter verse where it says, honor all people. Now, I know this one's a little touchy for some of us, but it says all people. It doesn't say just who you affiliate with as far as your political party and anyone who agrees with you. It doesn't say just who agrees with your religion. It doesn't say just who agrees with your morals and ethics and values. It doesn't say honor all people who are in your same tax bracket or who are in your same race. It says honor all people. And sometimes we are trying to separate and take people out of that honor because we don't agree with them or we don't like them or they're not the same race or they're doing these other things or, you know, they're not our political affiliation. So we're, you know, not honoring these other people when God says honor all people. Some of us didn't even honor the last president that was in office, but we're not going to talk about that. We uh, we did that man was dishonored the whole time he was in office, but we're not gonna mention that. <laughs> we're not gonna mention that. But my point is that we have to honor all people because all people are God's ch children. And if God says we need to honor all people, then that means all. That leaves no one out. And so thinking about that, does anyone have any thoughts? You meddling. That's what I think. <laughs> I think you uh, you're making making us uncomfortable with that truth. So uh, yeah, you throwing it down right now, man. That's that's so very true. You cannot honor God and not do what He says. He, and faith. Uh, you brought up Captain America. Captain America is not bulletproof. That's what the shield is for. And you and I are not flaming arrow proof. When Satan, you know, releases that arrow in your direction and it hits you, it's going to hurt and it's going to burn. Like, it, that, that's what it do. But that's what faith is. Because when you know who God is, you know what he has done for you in the past, it's like, no, nah, I, ain't, I ain't tripping off of that. So going back to Joseph, Joseph didn't know how this was going to end up. But he was like, I know that much. I know I ain't going to do this. So I'm going to have faith in God. Like I can't do this against God. So God honored, I'm sorry. So Joseph honored God and he honored Potiphar and he didn't dishonor himself, even though Mrs. Potiphar was dishonoring herself. Mm -hmm. Keep talking about the word faith. And what comes to mind is the basic tenet of faith. The New Testament says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's how big, that's how bad faith is. You gotta have that, got to have it. It's impossible to please God without it, first of all. Um. I never noticed, but I really, really like um, Hebrews 11, six definition of faith that it's, um, is believing that whoever comes who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who honestly seek him. If you are honestly seeking him, that means you are obeying him and following his steps. And I, what I love about the shit of faith is that we don't have to question or we don't have to um, wonder why is this and that um, is happening or... Um, or anything, we just hold behind that faith that God will, that God exists and so forth. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't, some things bad that happens, we don't have an answer to. Um, it might shake our faith, but if we hold still, even without knowing the answer, um, that's all we need. Yeah, yeah, and I think even taking that a step further, I think about what is our shield made of? What is our shield of faith made of? Because everyone's faith is not built the same. There is shallow faith and there is deep faith. And I think about even what Captain America's shield is made out of vibranium, which in you know the Marvel series is the strongest metal on earth. And just applying that to what what is our shield of faith? What is it made out of? Is it made out of that vibranium? Is it made out of wool? Is it made out of wood? Is it made out of cotton? Some of our shields of faith are very shallow and we can't really build the strength of our shield off of those things. Our shield has to be something that is sustainable. Our faith has to be something that is sustainable. And if it's built on the wrong material, 
then it's very easy for it to be destroyed. It's very easy for it to be put down. It's very easy, um, you know, to for it to be affected in a negative way. And so I think that's just something else to think about when it comes to the shield of faith is what is your um, shield made of? What is your faith made of? What type of material? And so um, kind of continuing on, I want to get to the helmet of salvation. Um, and so with the helmet of salvation, I kind of dumbed it down to thinking about riding a bike and the importance of wearing a helmet <laughs> while you're riding a bike. And I think about the importance of a helmet and it's for the protection of your head. Rather, mm -hmm. this helmet of salvation is for the protection of your mind. And I think about that and um, I just think of the verse that I uh, had it for this lesson, uh, Romans 12 too, um, which is about renewing our minds. Mm -hmm. And so um, I didn't kind of like want to go to that verse because I know like we all kind of know it, but I kind of wanted to get to a different verse uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, which says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And I think about the process of salvation and how it's a transformative process. It isn't something that, you know, is stagnant or is just, you know, kind of, um, yeah, just stagnant, but rather it's something that where we have to constantly be renewing our minds daily. We have to constantly be putting on this helmet because it can change our mind. It can change our views on things. And the one thing I think to understand about the helmet of salvation is that um, because I've heard some people talk about, you know, oh God, why doesn't he step in when he, people do this or that? And the one thing, um, maybe no one on this, uh, live stream that we're on, but people who may hear this live stream somewhere else may need to hear is God does not save from stupid. God does not save from stupid. He redeems and he restores from stupid, but he does not save people from stupid. And when we make stupid decisions, when we don't have on the helmet of salvation, there are consequences for that. God is still a God of discipline. And if you make a decision outside of God, God's not going to come to rescue you, but there is, but there is, um, redemption in God will always be there. He will always protect us. He will always restore us when we do make a mistake, when we do slip up somewhere. And so thinking about that, or when we make decisions that are childlike instead of manlike, and so, or womanlike. And so thinking about that, uh, what do we think about this, uh, the helmet of salvation? A headshot is game over. You, you mean that's everything else can be protected, but if, if you take a, a a blow to the head, bullet, whatever, you're done. And if you're not saved, you're done. Like nothing else matters. So when that weakness gets exposed you can have the best armor the greatest strength the greatest skills and talents and whatever else but if you die and go to hell it's game over so you got to know you're saved because when you know you're saved you'll act like you're saved and i think that's i mean of course the bible is perfect in its analogies and its examples but salvation being a helmet yeah, put that on your head, put that on your mind, like let that sit on your brain quite literally. And it's the greatest form of protection because if, if you do get taken out of the fight, oh, well, I still went to heaven. Hmm. That's a good point. Thanks, my brother. Did you have something else you wanted to add, Claire? That was it. I, that's a good point of connecting all that. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of like um, even circling back, we talked about the two most important or the two most deadly shots is your heart and your head. And 
those are the two that if you get one of those transformed in the negative way, then things can really spiral out of control. And so um, I really think it is important, like Mr. Anthony said, to have that helmet of salvation, make sure we're wearing it daily. And that's why there's the verse about, you know, renewing our minds daily. It's not like, a, oh, every other week or, you know, um, bi-weekly when we get paid and, you know, the Lord gives us some funds in our bank account. It's every day. And if we're not doing it every day, then we're susceptible, we're vulnerable. Um, and so uh, thinking about that, before we get to the last um, piece of the armor, did anyone have any thoughts? I was reading earlier this week um, when you were just talking about thanking God. You can thank God every day. If you think about it, there's so many things to thank him for. One, you have your mental faculties. You can see, you can walk, you can hear, you can eat, you can taste, you can touch. All these simple little things that we take for granted. But there are millions of people that don't have those things for whatever reason. So when I was reading these, this thing earlier this week, it, it talked about your, your prayer life and how you should start uh, trying to go into God's presence with thanksgiving first before we bring all your petitions, you know, to him. Thank him first because he, he, he wants to be thanked. He, he, he created everything. Yeah. So. Yes, I think that's also a, a good point as well. So thank you for that. So, um, I know we're running out of time, so I want to get to the last piece of armor uh, before we close. And so last piece of the armor is the sword of the spirit. And so for this, I'm going to read Hebrews 4.12. If uh, someone else for a little bit later wants to grab Proverbs 27.17, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. So <clears throat> Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Oh, I kind of read over. But um, needless to say, <laughs> needless to say, the sword of the spirit is an important part of this. And sometimes I think we're too busy swinging our sword at other people, trying to get them and convict them and cut them instead of directing our sword at us. And so um, kind of even taking that a level deeper, I think about how a lot of us, we have the Bible basics, but we don't want to get deep. And there's only certain things that God can do when we're in the deep instead of in the shallow. And I think about how God can do the dynamic in the deep. He can do the divine. He can develop us. He can direct us to our destiny, you know, and this is also not another sexy word, but dependence. Because I know our culture and our world preaches independence and doing things independently, not relying on others. But God is a God who we need to depend on um, daily as well. Um, and so I think about that. And when we don't um, have that sort of the spirit direct or that sort, yeah, that sort of the spirit directed at us to allow us to convict our hearts and our motives, our actions, um, I think it kind of is a disservice. And so um with that before um, i have the proverbs first read does anyone have any thoughts yeah you, you mentioned something that brought me to romans 12 11. um call for me and i will answer you and i will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. You were talking about digging deep and, and in Romans 12, 12, that's exactly what God's talking about. Yeah, I think um, you bring up a good point. I also think another part of that is, is um, there's only certain things that can be developed in the deep. And a lot of times we don't want to get go to the deep until we're desperate. And that's after already, that's after the damage is already done. And now we want to get deep with God. We want God to come and be our 911 rescue call. And God's like, uh, now I got to do more developing because now you didn't want to come here on your own. So now I got to show you that you need to depend on me. 
And so um, I think that was a very good um, point that you said, Mandy. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Anthony, you got to waste for those opportunities too. He, he's there for those opportunities too. Because whatever's going to bring it to him, even when you, when you have to pick up the phone for that 911, he's going to pick it up. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's going to pick it up because he wants to save you. That's the whole, that's his whole purpose to save. Mr. Anthony, you like you were going to say something or you're thinking something. That was no, I was having trouble hearing Manny, but uh, I, I heard him at the end there. And I, I guess while I'm talking, might, might as well jump in with, with a little something, right? Uh, this idea of the sword of the spirit. That ain't your sword. You, you, don't, you don't get to swing it and cut who you want to cut. We are privileged to carry the word of God. And uh, as an armor bearer, you know, because Goliath had, a, had an armor bearer. Like that, that's our job. So I've said this before, but we, we are not David in that story of David and Goliath. We're we're Saul and the brothers and everybody else who is terrified because we recognize this giant is too big for us. But Jesus is our savior. He defeats the giant, not us. And so we get a chance to carry the sword of the spirit. Like the sword belongs to the spirit. And it's almost like he's like, hey, hand me my sword. Uh, I'm finna go to work. Give me my sword. Yes, Lord, here you go. Boom, here you go. And, and we get to participate sometimes in, in our lives where, you know, you get an opportunity to talk with somebody and you're talking and you're like, yo, where did that come from? Because that wasn't me. Like that was, a, that was way better than I would have come up with. And it's like something just coming to your mind. And I, I firmly believe that's the, the Holy Spirit working and his word, the word of God is sharp. <clears throat> it, it, it's precise and um it's it's clinical you know it's it's not a machete you know where you just be hacking at something you can't do surgery with no machete you know but the sword the word of god is is laser beam focused razor sharp to where he does not miss the target he doesn't cut what don't need cut divide the soul from the spirit what even does that mean like <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, right. we, we use those terms interchangeably, but he's like, my sword is, is sharp enough to divide them. And mm -hmm. you can't even distinguish sometimes between them, but he can and he can divide. So, man, we could just go on and on because because God is so amazing like that. But yeah, the sword of the spirit, that's your only that's your only offense as well, because his word is the only thing that has any power to, to fight a spiritual battle. You know, my, my science, my reasoning, my, my jokes, my whatever I got, that junk's no good. Only the sword of the spirit has, has any divine power to fight spiritual battles. Yeah, I think um, you brought up a good point of even not swinging our sword or thinking that it's a weapon. Um, God's word is to direct. It's not to um, attack other people. And a lot of times we, we use the, we try to weaponize the Bible um, against people who don't agree with us or that don't understand. And we're swinging around a sword that cuts deep. You can't just go swinging around God's word like that because you can hurt people. You can um, cause more damage than, you know, um, knowledge with that. And I even think about how sometimes we try to avoid that ourselves where we're not willing to get deep because we know the word will convict us. <laughs> we know that it will cut us in that way that we need to be cut and God's calling us to that deep end. He's like, come out here. Allow me to show you some things. And we're like, ah, I don't want to be cut by the sword of the spirit. Please, Lord, I don't want that smoke. And, um, but, but that's something we need. And it's hard to progress in the faith. It's hard to continue to be faithful when you're not getting that deep connection with God, where you're just keeping it on the shallow end. And so um, I appreciate that point that you brought, Mr. Anthony. And so um, as we get ready to close, can uh, whoever has Proverbs 27, 17, can they um, please read that, please? I can read it. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Right. Thank you. And so I think about this, and the question that pops into my head is, who are we being sharpened by, and who or what your life is causing your sword to become dull? 
because our sword we should be sharpening with someone else and you know we can't sharpen ourselves we don't always have the best <laughs> judgments and whatnot with our sword and who we're sharpening it with and so i think just things to think about is who are we being sharpened by and the people we are being sharpened by are they causing our swords to become dull are they causing us are they causing our sword to rust are they causing it to catch some dust and so um those are just some things to think about but does anyone have any final thoughts about um the sword of the spirit before we close one more verse came to mind mm -hmm. go ahead um first peter five and six i think it is 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 therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cared for you and it's something you said earlier in that verse popped into my mind I thought about uh, this verse, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, it starts, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity on the one who falls down, who falls and has no one to help them up. If two also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Mm -hmm. It's important. Who are we sharpening with? Who are we surrounded by? Who are the people that we're relying on to pick us up when we fall down? I think uh, that verse is a introspective way to think about um, the sword of the spirit and just our lives in general when we have relationship with other people because those things are just as impactful on our faith as well. I know there's um, a lot of women out there, they, um, They don't want, they want their guy to spend time only with them. It's my guy, nobody else. No me in time. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> You're not lying. You're not lying, Claire. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I got into it. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's just not. And so um, I am big fan of how and um uh, spending time with guys and he has romance. Like they're just all, I know I can be weird sometimes, but you know what I mean? Like I just love it when um when we as women allow our brothers or sisters or even our best friends to be sharpened by other people and to have other influence, other Christian influences in life. Cause we need that we need that community. Um and I think doing the opposite is, is not loving, it's, it's pretty hateful. Yeah, uh, I think you bring up a good point. Sometimes uh, we have those love blinders on, we think we can always know what's best for our partner, but someone else with an outside perspective can always add something that maybe you can't see with those love blinders on. They say uh, <laughs> love is blind, and part of that <laughs> could be because you have, you're in so much love that you can't see some things you have blind spots for a person you miss things because you're so in love with the person so i think that was a good point to bring up tell yeah and men we need men and women we need women we need um someone who can speak our language and um struggle while we struggle yeah that was a very good point yeah. so uh I'm out of things to say. Um, that was <laughs> that was the lesson on the armor of God. Like I said, lessons taught are you armed. So um, hopefully going forward this week, we can continue to be armed and make sure we're armed with all these things. And so um, that's really all I've got. So appreciate you guys for attending. That was an excellent lesson. Thank you. Yes, yes sir. All right, well.
Yes, we see y'all next time. God willing. Yep. All right. Sounds good. All right. Catch you guys later. The boy got to eat. Maybe on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. We got uh, Bible study live on Sunday. Love to have you guys in attendance. Uh, if not then, then definitely we'll hope to see you next uh, Wednesday. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. Bye, Sam. See you guys. Thank you, Robin.